G'day, James. How are you? I'm very well, my friend. How are you? Very good. So this is the the third time we've come down for an official sort of conversation. And we were thinking that perhaps um, we could have a discussion about self-help. Uh, now it's a very open uh, concept to sort of start from, and I imagine you'll take it some interesting places. From the top, I was thinking that a major problem with the self-help industry at large is the fact that it's market-driven rather than peer-reviewed, right? So which is to say that at least when you go to a psychologist uh, who is presumably going to help you, you can confidently say that this person is either qualified or not. And we were just saying that could even be extrapolated to a personal trainer. You know, you can say someone is either qualified or not. However, when someone bleeds through the algorithm, um, you know, or the book publishing lottery, they are there because of different forces and it's not necessarily qualification. You know, they're sort of popularity based, definitely survivorship bias driven and uh, therefore a little bit less accountable. Um, so as a start, like that immediately skews the tangible benefits that someone might get from, say, an Internet guru, you know, the Internet self-help guru. Well, you say about qualifications, first of all, qualifications don't necessarily on their own mean anything by default. I'm thinking of, uh, I was watching with one of my friends last night, actually, a, uh, a therapist on YouTube. I'll leave the person anonymous. Uh, no one associated with any of our spheres. It was, it was like I say, associated with my friend's real life life. Yeah. Um, uh, and she identifies herself as, hello, I'm XYZ, I'm a senior therapist. It's like, oh, okay, there must be something important about you. And she's talking about um, what to do when you overthink how we always overthink and we always overthink down negative pathways and negative thoughts and never about good, good things. And what I want you to do as a therapeutic exercise, this is the apex of a clinical work is to go ah, ah, every time a negative thought comes to mind, just go. Ah, ah. So you start thinking, thinking about pain. Ah, ah. It's like, Excuse me. What? So if you, if you want to talk about qualifications strictly, it's like, I can understand why someone would be more attracted to an internet guru mm. than to somebody like mm. that. You kind of just highlighted the, Maybe the difference why an internet guru might might be more popular than say the the qualified peer reviewed psychologist or person that's going to offer the self help. Like the internet guru is far more seductive, right? Oh, uh, they're yeah. they're they're far more attractive, and because they can build an image of all these other people that they've helped before them, which is the survivorship bias, it becomes very easy for you to come in and be like, well, I'm going to be a part of this as well. People with qualifications, as I said, they don't, it doesn't necessarily mean anything. And there's another advantage we'll say to um, a young man or a young woman's or someone who's just stuck in a ruts psyche. And that's how internet gurus can often present as manner personalities. This is a phrase that uh, Jung talked about. Uh, someone who is who is larger than life and the way it would be described by say pop Jungians would be they are tapping into the archetypal layer of reality and they are channeling forces beyond them and that gives them a mesmerizing capacity. That's not necessarily true whatsoever. There are multiple ways in which someone could be a man of personality. One one of the ways you can you can um, determine this is something that Pauline said on the Jungians Live by channel, determine if someone is a man of personality is can they ch take a joke about themselves? You know, it's almost like the same marker of um, whether or not you can identify someone's inflated or if yourself's inflated. Can you can you take a joke? So th we we are. If, if you look at the scene, we've got a young young person or whatever, and or again could be an older person, and they've experienced a lot of nonsense over their lives, and they want to. They have a calling from what we would call the genomic self, or just that numinous feeling of I want to become better. They enter into a landscape which is primarily these days on the internet, and it's like, well, who do I go to? Well, the institutions like you're talking about typically are uh, largely ineffective most of the time. And I think that's a fair thing to say. That's you're talking about the some of the peer reviewed institutions, some of the more yes. classical. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And they, a lot of them lack spirit and personality, but that just comes with being in, in mm. um, say a government owned or a government funded institution. There's like a lack of vitality there. It's, it's not inspiring to go to a CBT therapist is not inspiring. And I use them as the example, because they're say the frontline guys you would find in the NHS. So you, you're, you're suffering with, with whatever it's like, I either have a calling to be someone better, or you've got uh, some kind of psychosocial maladaptation, or you've got some kind of psychobiological um, uh, problem or so, you know, anxiety, depression that operates in like a waveform. The standard things that young people or indeed older people will report for themselves. So the institutions are kind of like, uh, and there's an element of like judgmental parenthood about them. Oftentimes mm. is what people mm. will, will report. But then you go to the, the internet guru scene. It's very, very, very seductive. Very, 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 very seductive. Super seductive. And it's, yeah. And it's like, well, very what are the areas in which people, people rise to the top of that sort of field? Oh yeah. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. Um, but... so, so what, what areas are people going to be focusing on? Well, it's gonna be different for men and for women largely, mm. but you can track the instincts that are underneath the guru scene. 
you can, you know, a diet is a, is an enormous one and it varies in you know, a carnivore, keto, whatever, you know, you, mm. there's something wrong with the modern diet and we must fix it, which is a completely fair point to be, mm. you know, to, to, to be fair to, to these people. We can track an instinct, a pretty obvious instinct underneath that. And then a lot so of it you're... will come down to sexual energy and relationships as well. It's like, well, that's going to be an instinct too. And then a lot of it is going to be moral behavior, whether that be in a, in a political or a philosophical environment. Uh, for, for example, this is something that um, Jordan Peterson primarily does. This is the primary influence uh, he would have on an individual's, we'll say, an anima, or so-called anima complex or relating function complex that sits on top of the anima archetype. It shapes mm -hmm. how someone relates. And it's like, well, Peterson tells you how to behave. It's like he's 12 rules for life. And now he's got 12 more rules for life. And there could be more rules for life. It's like, so how I behave? Well, that's the father dynamic, the, the father instinct, the confirmation instinct, as well as the instinct to learn how to relate. So we can track them all in there. But the problem is they lack any, and to be fair, well, they, they lack any kind of systemiza systematization. And a lot of the time, people, as you were pointing out quite rightly, mate, people rise up the ranks because they're charismatic, not because they have real world experience. Mm -hmm. That's a problem. That's, that's a also, problem. yeah, that's also the consequence of the survivorship bias. How are you determining what's genuinely going to be worth your time and therefore good for you and that which is going to be taken advantage of you because it might be easy to separate it from say the institutional stuff but then when you're looking at the self-help and then also i was thinking uh, or, or just wanted to confirm actually um you said uh, that a lot of them might be tapping in like like an instinctual hook through the diet like are you sort of saying that there are certain things that instinctually we're all trying to solve and so oh, yeah. like they might they might fish you in by coming at it through the diet uh like for example you know he, this diet completely changed my life and went from zero to 100 and then you you're hooked in on the diet and then he feeds you a bunch of other bs which ultimately ends up in a course Oh yeah. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. I mean, the, the first thing you were talking about there, it's a good example of how you can, this is not an example of yourself. It's a hypothetical question, mm. how you could track the um, negative anima or so-called negative anima, negative relating function in somebody's typology. Cause the frame, you can almost look at the, the, the frame in which that question's phrased. It's like, so we've got this, this peer reviewed help, which might be unreliable. And we've got the internet gurus who also might be unreliable. How do we determine what's right and what's, what's not? Well, ultimately, if we return back to what the genome wants, rather than the frame of the question which is like zoomed in many sort of layers down then we go we don't have to answer that question at all we can actually throw the question away and zoom out and say we don't need any of it technically there's the underlying principle that's that's driving underneath it if we remove the uh, trapping frame of i need guidance to move from where i am now to where someone who i should be that's the call of the genomic self that's that numinous feeling to drive us forward and it's like do we need it from any of these people or is the answer actually coming from within? Because if you track a lot of what, I would say exclusively all of what the internet gurus are, are, are doing, this mm -hmm. is where my own introverted thinking could potentially trap me. It's like, in particular, the, the diet one, the diet scene is one that, uh, because of my biological training, sits well in my heart. It's like, maybe there is a problem with the modern diet. It's like, probably. If we look at the evidence properly, the answer to that is definitely yes. But in terms of practical yeah. bandwidth for 99% of people, especially if you're young, no. And that's absolutely fair to say. You're going to be okay. You're going to be fine. Will you be operating optimal vitality? Probably not, but you're going to be absolutely fine. Mm. But in general, the, the different areas where these people are looking at, um, so especially in terms of relationships and psychosocial functioning, like for example, with young men, it's generally how to gain status, how to work harder, how to talk to women. Those abilities are within yourself. They're innate. They're ancestral. And for a guru to come and call, you're right. It's like a, they're, they're, there's like a hook. The, the, the instinctual hook will get you to come in. But really the answer should be my interest in this is coming from myself. And also paradoxically, the answer to this is going to be coming from myself as well. That's the journey work of the personal myth. That stuff, by the way, on the negative anima, uh, trapping the relating function to sort of zoom in on a question and be like, so it must be one or two of these answers. It's like, that's it. That's in the personal myth guide. And it's an important thing to work out when moving through your own personal myth. Because it, cause it's, um, uh, it, it, will, it will send you down all kinds of very, very strange rabbit holes. And you can pull yourself out of it by saying, huh, it's, it's, uh, I don't have to engage with that frame whatsoever. Very mm. useful therapeutically as well. Does that help give some kind of orientation of what's going on? I thought that was yeah. an interesting point to make. Yeah, I mean, for sure. And uh, you do mention the personal myth guide at the end there, which is something we're going to dive into as well. But I first do want to sort of lay a decent groundwork over the efficacy of the internet guru, the abusive nature of some of them as well, abusive nature, just because it sort of takes advantage. Um, but 
ultimately the core of what your message is, um, and this is true anytime I speak with you and also um, true throughout, it's like a through line throughout the Jung to live by content as well, is that it all is an intrinsic journey along the lines of discovering your own personal myth and at the very core of it, being in touch with your instincts. And that like kind of leads me to think that is the guru even necessary? You know, even if it's a good guru, even if it's like a good mentor, you know, say your relationship with Steve, you know, or say uh, Gordon Ramsay in his relationship with his initial boss, this Marco Pierre White guy, I think we're getting the name wrong, but mm -hmm. it's, it's, it's along those lines, who he now has a totally failed relationship with. Um, um, is this guru necessary? Is this idea, because it's a very popular idea on, say, finance Twitter or business Twitter, but everyone's looking for this mentor. Everyone's, everyone's being told this idea that the key to your success is to find a good mentor. And then it, you know, on the spectrum, then you have a, at one end, the snake oil salesman who will just straight up sell you mentorship, which by the way, I have a, I have an anecdote about as well, mm. um, all the way to like, you know, legitimate, you're a high performer, uh, a guy who's already made it identifies you as a high performer, takes you under his wing and tries to, um, you know, lead you down whatever path he went down. So is the mentor, is the guru, is this actually something that is, um, necessary? Is it good? Or at the end of the day, is it just our relating function trying to latch on to people uh, that have, have experienced the success that we envision for ourselves? You know? Yeah. Yeah. And I know well, there's a lot there, but you go. This, 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 is, a, this is a great example of um, dialectical syncretism. It's the fourth pillar of psychosystems analysis, the, um, the school of depth psychology Stephen Pauline created. Um, dialectical syncretism as, a, as, an, as an alchemical philosophy, if you like, is, is um, taking, taking two different, well, dialectical, so it's like a conversation, and syncretism, meaning like, you know, bringing things together in sync. So as, as an example of that, it's like you're coming from this field of uh, money, Twitter, and finance and whatever, where you've got a definition of mentor, which presumably is like someone who can teach me things no one else can or a very few amount of people can. Whereas in a depth psych psychological sense, a mentor would be far more, well, for, first of all, on the surface would be say professional development, but it does then go down into that personal development side. So for example, it's, um, it's an Eastern phrase that Steve told me a long time ago. He said, uh, what, what they say over in the East is a, um, a mentor for a day is a father for life. Very different because if you're looking for a business based mentor, it's like presumably you don't want them to father you. But, and when you mentioned the relating function, that's the area in which to take a look at it. Because if you mm. look at Gordon Ramsay and his mentor, the two act very, very similar. He was trained to relate within, presumably, I don't know if Gordon Ramsay's like Gordon Ramsay all the time. I mm. hope he is. That mm. would be hilarious. <laughs> but, but he, within I that the idea is not, though, but which is a real shame, yeah. but, but within the psychosocial niche of the kitchen and being on camera, he relates in the same way as his mentor does, but that doesn't have to be the way that these things manifest, but we do see the way or the, 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 the dynamic that's at play when a mentor steps more into that sort of um, father role, rather than say being a personalized textbook who can just relay off in information. That would be to try and bring the two frames together, a very, very loose surface level example of dialectical syncretism. To try and to try and take your frame and my frame and see what we can blend together, what the common language is, so we can move forward. That's necessary therapeutically when you've got a Freudian and a Jungian and an Adlerian and a CBT and a medic and everything all trying to communicate together. You go up to a Freudian, you say, "Oh, the anima." They go, "What are you talking about?" And the Freudian then goes, "The id," and the Jungians go, "Oh, ha, 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 the id's not yeah, real." Yeah. That kind of thing. Um, but but so looking at the, the the relating function then in this sense, it's 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 like the Peterson example I mentioned uh, a couple minutes ago. What's the role of a father? What's the role of a mother? What are those fundamental instincts? Or what Jung would have called at that level of mother and father archetypes, but we just call them in instincts that need to be fulfilled. Well, psychosocial relating is absolutely essential. So if you're looking for a guru to tell you how to behave, that's the level of psychodynamic that we're operating at. Because we, we might approach them with ego fiction, say somebody who's talking about uh, NoFap. For example, very, very, very common, a massive meme. It's like, mm -hmm. ah, nofap helps me become a real man. Nofap helps me with X, Y, Z. There's all this science behind nofap, the science of porn. I don't want to straw man it at all. But there's there's these reasons. But really, what's happening is you're listening to listening to someone telling you how to behave fundamentally with nofap right at the level of instinct, right down there. If you take something like uh, money Twitter, I've been on money Twitter for I haven't been on in a, in a while, mate, because it makes me feel physically sick. I can't I, re I really can't take it. But I know the general themes and the way everyone relates is basically the same. And a lot of it then the reason why it, 
I've spoken to quite a few people actually, uh, people of around my own age, entrepreneur types, mm. who um, who experience money Twitter, and we all know the same gurus from there and, and whatever, and uh, they all report the same feeling of being hurt on the inside when they're exposed to these ideas it's like their manhood has been hit by being exposed to these people mm. and it's like oh i'm not earning six figures a day oh i'm not drinking my black coffee at four in the morning oh why why, why aren't why haven't i got a mentor that kind yeah. of thing why is it my that, internet business uh turning over thirty thousand a month like exactly really everyone else's exactly and it's, it's like you can understand why that would be appealing in particular to a young man if we go right back to instinct you've got status in there you've all but then you've also got the way a man should behave because then you also get things like escape the nine to five anyone who doesn't escape the nine to five is an idiot they're brainwashed anyone who doesn't have ten thousand dollars in their bank account is an idiot and brainwashed anyone who can't afford to uh, to tip the waiter is an idiot and brainwashed. A man is like this. So that's the dynamic that we're seeing. There is an element of transference there, regardless of whether or not it's a more, say that, that Eastern style metaphor where someone's coming in for personal development to actually help you fix your relating function overtly versus someone who's you think you're just learning things from to gain status over. It's not. There is an element of transference there always. You're allowing that person into your psyche to influence you. Always, and you might you might dream about that person. That person might be a significant checkpoint in your personal myth story when you when you go through it again. And it's like, okay, that's that's the rough dynamic that we're seeing. So, I mean, how to discriminate, or whether or not gurus are, are useful as such? It's like, well, as a general question, yes, they could be. And chances are, if you're going towards a guru, you don't have the the knowledge by default because you're going mm. to a guru to discriminate what's right and what's wrong. I would I would reframe the question around if it was myself approaching it or therapeutically with a patient and go, what's driving somebody towards the guru? Then it's powerful because then say if you've got a problem with your gut, like go back to the diet example, you can then safely with psychological hygiene go to that guy who maybe is outside the establishment who has experience with natural medicine or the microbiome or whatever and be like, okay, this might help, and it might help. You know, versus someone who goes, all of my problems are the source of my gut. And this particular, probably elderly man on the internet or middle-aged man on the internet is going to tell me how to fix if I buy all his products. And isn't this great? And I want to be exactly like him. And he's also got all these other hobbies and bits and pieces and the way mm. he talks. And I'm starting to pick those up as well. Mm. There will be an element of that. Always, always, always. his interests as well. Identifying oh, yeah. them as your own. Oh, yeah. But it sounds like, um, you know, we're, we're... it might be true because there it's not like it's all negative experiences interacting with these gurus or trying to yeah. take on the ideas of these gurus like i think the fact that they've survived in the public consciousness with such force does suggest that there is actually some good being withdrawn from them um it, it, it could be the case that it's a sort of net detriment like they're taking more from you than you're getting from them but maybe it is the case that it, it's sort of just like a a stage, a step that one must go through, you know, like mm. they, they almost have to see these different gurus, um, project their, project themselves onto these different gurus, um, to then be let down by them and to then realize that after I implemented whatever their process was, it actually didn't change me for the better at all. I'm, I'm in fact, exactly the same as I was before. Like maybe you have to go through that process several times to then get to the point where you're like, oh, this is, I always come back to one thing and that's my instinctual self. And I always have the same problem. And that's, you know, my love for sweets or my proclivity to have five pints instead of two, like, <laughs> and, and, and you kind of, you, you come back, I think to whatever this sort of baseline is. And it might be true that it's the same problems again and again, that are getting you wrong. And, you know, like, um, I, I read online uh, this uh, quote about self-help, and I think it's quite relevant here. He said, self-help is just another form of avoidance or procrastination. You know, in doing your 6 a.m. wake-ups, your cold showers, your caffeine detox, you avoid making the actual change that is needed most. In most cases, this actual change is much harder than a superficial behavior change as well. And it's true that I think a lot of the, the gurus do they're giving you these superficial behavior changes, you know, very tangibly, you know, don't, don't masturbate. Don't, um, yeah, don't, uh, don't come for like six months and you'll be a, you'll be a super strong, effective human, you know, like this sort of nonsense. Um, but I like the way he says it a lot there. It's like, in most cases, this actual change is much harder than whatever the superficial behavior changes that this guru is sort of telling you to do. And in the worst cases, in the most egregious cases, charging you money for as well. Oh, dude, I, I, I love what you've just said there. Absolutely love it. it because it, it, 
we, we're not saying, or at least myself, I'm not saying, and I know Stephen Point aren't, aren't either, uh, there should never be any gurus, and what everyone should do is just return to their personal myth. That would be ideal. I'm not going to lie. That would be absolutely ideal. But that's not a realistic scenario. Depending on what the stage somebody's at in their, their, their personal myth journey or they're tracking their own anima development or whatever, they'll be more receptive to messages on the outside than others. Now, some of that's a measure of refle reflexivity, but these things like their favorite gurus are defended because they, there's a real powerful psychodynamic at play in the psyche to your favorite guru or your sweeter favorite gurus, all those ideas that's operating at the level of complex. So, so someone is going to go through that journey. Someone's going to go through the hero's journey many times. If the hero's journey never ends, it's just, it constantly goes on and on and on and on and on. The marker is whether or not you can remove that transference. If you can remove that transference, you've, you've completed that chapter of your personal myth in that sort of, um, if we're making it more mythic and more narrative than necessarily it needs to be. Mm. It's like, so I got what I needed and I actually learned that what I was getting was, it could have been arbitrary. It could have been anything that the person was telling me. It's, it's, uh, I could have gone to an OFAP guy or a diet guy or a workout guy or a, or a pickup artist guy. It happened to be that particular set of wounds I had at that time. And by wounds, I mean, unactualized potential or psychosocial maladaptation or whatever it happens to be could have been anyone put them in. And I've actually learned that, um, I have the power in my own hands. I've understood what was drawing me towards this person. It was, I felt like I needed to be guided and I felt like I needed somebody to help shape the way I relate. Yep. I've taken the power back for myself. That's the healthiest. Mm -hmm. And that's the way of forgiving of everybody who falls into these traps. Because they are technically traps because that you, 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 you fall in, you'll tread water and, mm -hmm. you know, um, generally nothing good comes of any of this stuff. I've not met anybody. And I, obviously I've spoken to quite a few people in these, in these spheres, either viewers or friends or whatever. No one has reported sustainable, beneficial personality change from exposure to a guru. Nobody. Mm. Mm. That's weird. That's really weird. People have re reported thinking that they did. That's very different to be like, Oh, I now, uh, I now live a more meaningful life. It's like, well, what do you mean? Are you, are you, are you relating better? Like, do you feel better in yourself? And it's like, well, no, you know, have you moved forward in life? Well, I have uh, more money. So do you feel happier? No, mm. you know, so it's like one, one dimensional and we can track exactly which instincts were at play and precisely one-to-one -one corollary between the guru, the way that they manifested psychosocially and the relationship with your psyche and the particular quote unquote benefits that moved you forward. Gurus can be useful, but it's like, it's, it's, um, it's like a little boy needing a father. And uh, none of us want that. That, yeah. that is to say that to someone would instinctually hurt them as well. And it, w it would make them realize. But I, honestly, I don't even think it will instinctually hurt a lot, of pe a lot of people. It seems more people are more than happy to admit that, yeah, no, I am looking for that guidance. How else can you explain the truly unbelievable popularity of a man like Jordan Peterson, a man who I, I don't right. want to harp on a topic that we've spoken of uh, at length. And frankly, everyone speaks of at length. But he uh, is the ultimate father projection in the public consciousness of the West, right? Like people that actually listen to him. I mean, the fact that he's come back now as popular as he was before, perhaps even more popular. It's like it speaks to what was this giant gaping chasm that he didn't fill the first time around that he's somehow going to come and fill this time around. You know, like um, I think one of the things that's that connected with me most when we first spoke was you said that moving on from the guru is where the the benefit is made. It's where the development in yourself is made. If there is such a thing as like self development from another person, it's going through the journey of the guru coming out the other side and being able to set them aside and say, thank you. You've helped me now uh, step aside. I'm going to continue on my way here. Um, you know, and, and then I related further to uh, a man, Nassim Taleb, who I, totally projected onto, you know, wanted to emulate completely. Um, and then it got to the point where it's like, you know, in fact, no, I've, I've, I've moved on from you. I've taken the best that I can from you and I really appreciate it, but you're no longer going to influence me in any, uh, yeah. in any sort of way. Um, but yeah. there's something, uh, I think, uh, hanging, hanging over the chat. And that's the notion that, I mean, yourself, James P. Dowling, mm -hmm have been this guru type mm. or many people. And oh, yeah. even furthermore, the um, people following Jung to live by might also be projecting these same feelings onto uh, the content that you're creating over there. You know, mm. so uh, how do you think about this? How do you, how do you, you know, rationalize it and deal with it? 
Oh, yeah, yeah. Well, myself, before I met Stephen Pauline, I would certainly say I was in the guru camp, without a doubt. I had nowhere near the reach that, say, the normal gurus that people talk about would, would have, but that's not an, an excuse. It was um, myself attempting to cure the world of my own disease, uh, basically. And you, you, you can track the things I was interested in and the people I spoke about and everything, and you could do a very good job. The content is still up. Mm. Uh, on say the the, the um, Uberboyo channel, mm. uh, and you you can track if you use say the personal myth guide to go through it to track your own stuff. You can reverse engineer mine quite nicely and see what my wounds are. And I've actually been fairly open about that. Mm. When it when it when it comes to young students to live by, it's like are we are we are we gurus? No. Reason why is we. <laughs> it depends on your definition of guru to some some degree. But Steve and Pauline have their massively long clinical career. They have put in the hours. They've put in the years, and they've lived an authentically. Uh, Freud, Adler, Jung, if you like. We just call it Jung because Jung to live by. Life. And they're open about that on the channel as well. Now, someone can come to, to Stephen Pauline and be like, oh, you're full of shit. But it's like, uh, we don't care, mm. to be completely honest. It's one of the rules on our Discord server. It's like, we don't exist solely to be challenged. We, we, we are pluralistic in beliefs. We want open conversation. Critique if you think there is a worthwhile critique. But what you're seeing in those moments when someone will come and just be like, oh, they're, they're full of shit, they're idiots. There are, there are Reddit threads about myself, for example, of saying horrible things. And it's like, this is transference. This is exactly what we're talking about. Transference can be positive or it can be negative in that strict sort of polar sense. Obviously, it's not really polar, really. It's a false dichotomy. But say people could have a, a very strong transference on, and this does happen all the time, a strong positive transference onto myself or a strong negative transference onto myself. Yep. Or Steve or Pauline. So it's the same dynamic we're seeing that draws people to the gurus. And it's the same thing we see when people are drawn to one guru and then they hate another guru. Mm -hmm. If you remember to the um, uh, Jordan Peterson and Sam Harris, I think it's a good example of this, mm. where, where suddenly the entire self-development scene overnight was split between people who are like, I'm atheist, who existed forever, you know, although they've existed mm -hmm. since Richard Dawkins came on as the potentially the OG internet guru. I'm not entirely sure. I'm not necessarily a historian of the internet, but he, mm -hmm. he must be there in the early days. On sort of the Sam Hitchens, Harris side, I, I, Hitchens and, could well be, yeah, because his YouTube presence um, from even when he was still alive was huge, bigger than Dawkins. Um, yeah, but that's actually a really fun sidebar. Is Hitchens the original internet guru? Interesting, but go on. Yeah, well, it could be, could be. So I would just say Hitchens and, and, and Dawkins. Mm. And of course, therefore, you get this whole legion of atheist young men who are like, of course, this mm. is the way to be, uh, to really live my life is to mm. be an atheist. It's, like, it's the same thing. It's how do I live my life? How do I relate? What's my modus operandi in the world? And then you've got the Peterson side who suddenly overnight, everyone's an expert in Christianity and <laughs> Nietzsche and everything else who goes, nah, nah, but there's, it's not obvious that the Bible is wrong. And, and they're all at each other's throats. From, yeah, and atheists have gone from... Uh, there's no such thing as God to, well, there's definitely a higher being, but I don't think it's God. I mean, <laughs> yes, that's yeah. how that shows how uh, th that shows the localization in the psyche of where these ideas are originating. It's mm. coming from with both of those sides, a father complex there is. And it's therefore it's very loose and malleable, especially in the context of transference. So an idea will just be, will swap and change, as you've seen. Like, I note it in myself, too. I was the biggest diehard Richard Dawkins atheist. Then Jordan mm. Peterson comes along. It's like, mm. it's not obvious that the Bible is wrong. Overnight! Overnight. It's like, so this was exactly. the core of my identity that was yeah. right in my self-concept. It's like, no, no, it was on your complex. That was controlling everything you were doing because you were a little boy. Mm. That's what we're seeing there. Totally so, malleable, just to someone who's a little bit more charismatic than the, than the last exactly right mm. exactly right or happens to speak to your particular wounds or your yep. particular wounds at that time than anybody yep. else but this is something that's that as, as we're recording uh, reminded of something steve wrote on the discord yesterday he tries his very very best and very successfully to be a a, a transparent p a pane of glass to transmit the light through and he, he understands that the light does not originate within himself the light is ancestral and it's passed down the ego's job at the end of the day so that which we call james for example or that or which we call the uh, viewer who's watching or listening to this, that the ego's job is to make uh, some level of executive action and control, preferably towards optimal psychosocial maladaptation. That's its job. Everything else isn't you. It's not yours. The, 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 the source of your knowledge and wisdom and the things that you learn come from the outside world, come from experience, but you're not the source of it. That's very different. That's a buffer against a man of personality. So maybe maybe useful for this conversation, we can actually fractionate guru down and say, because it, because obviously we can say lots of people, it could it be a teacher? Mm -hmm. So well, it could be. Uh, the the gurus I'm talking about then, which is the vast majority of them, would be mana personalities, those inflated sense sense of selves who are um, 
in, in, in the worst possible example you, you can think of would be like a Hitler type character. But the good manner personalities as they as they manifest, say, as internet gurus, mm-hmm. is the same psychodynamic category, not say in terms of moral relevance. Mm. Um, that that's the thing to watch out for. So mm. with young young to live by, it's kind of like you've got Stephen Pauline's forty year long clinical career. They've decided that uh, they would like to do this kind of work to help people online, which is something which is incredibly rare for someone of their say status and their experience. And it's like then they get all kinds of negative transference flown their way, and it's kind of like. Stick, stick to your current guru then see how well right, that yeah. does it but that's your story and your myth and it's like we're not going to interfere with that and the people who are in the server and the people who've spoken to us and the students everything else is kind of like no this is actually working rapidly really well so it's, it's, it's up to the, the individual how receptive and, re- and reflexive they are and that will mm. vary almost like a bell curve biologically across different there's, people there's, uh, there's so much so many so many uh, different avenues i'd like to take that um and i'll just put i'll i'll put them out there and hopefully you can touch on all of them eventually but maybe one at a time but the one that stands out most is uh circling back to how we first defined the guru the fact that it's the internet guru and then the establishment guru but then there's also within the internet um side of things people outside of the establishment who are still legit and then who are not legit and it feels like um because um depth psychology isn't necessarily recognized by the establishment right so mm-hmm. it sits outside of the establishment though it nonetheless has the um the the beneficial quality that it um peer-reviewed practice might have yeah. um, so there's there's that like um uh, talking about that for a second but then um the 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 theme which really always is the theme of i think um good Jungian content but then also whenever i speak with you is it's instincts it's coming back to identifying what your complexes are and how can you tap into that instinct to get rid of that complex the father uh, complex is probably the most popular especially when you're discussing uh, among men but then um I wanted to ask, how do you deal with that criticism, James? Uh, because, you know, you said there's entire Reddit posts uh, dedicated to shitting on you. I mean, that's mm. how does one remain psychologically healthy and 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 manage with that? You know, uh, yeah. I, I, I typically just don't engage. I mean, we, we, we get um, uh, we, we, we get a lot of uh, nonsense. But with, first of all, we get a lot of engagement. Say so, so more than the average per say views or whatever else that we get, and that that includes all say different funnels that we have, including into the Discord. Um, but with that in proportion, we get a lot of negative nonsense as well. And it's like I choose typically not to engage. If I see something that's that's overtly negative against myself, immediately the first thing that will put me off is is the is the tone. If the tone is very very, uh, I hate you. And mm-hmm. I know more than you. I'm like, okay, like, what's driving this? Is it a legitimate critique? Because I I can be critiqued a lot by by especially say older people who've lived life more than myself, and that's perfectly legit. It's when it's it's having the hygiene to look at something that you see or somebody that you see and be like, okay, what's driving this? And most of the time, it, when if you look at the tone as the uh, general marker, it's negative transference, and, so, and I can understand why. I can understand why, mm. um, and I think anyone can probably work out why. Uh, and, and it's the same with anyone who's speaking on the internet. Uh, and your your complexes will fill in the gaps as to what my life will be like. And there's there's there's, there's all kinds of stuff. Um, so I typically don't engage. It's like you're always going to get this. It's the same stuff that you can get therapeutically with a negative transference. All of a sudden, a mm. patient can just turn around and flip. Or you're engaging in depth with someone who you know. It doesn't have to be within the consulting room. And all of a sudden, the relationship can flip. And all kinds of bad things can, can, can come out of that other person directed at yourself. Mm. And um, it's just, you need to have ego strength. Sure. Is, uh, which is the most recent uh, student seminar actually that we had was on ego strength and the necessity of that. To have those strong boundaries in place. Mm-hmm. To be like, no, I'm, I'm, I'm moving forward. I've taken a look and detach. Mm-hmm. It's, it's, it's literally just a case of that. It, uh, and it's not always been that easy. Uh, sometimes negative feedback used to really upset me. Mm-hmm. Um, but you know, you, like it would just dwell as an anxiety. Chin. Yeah, yeah. Uh, it was quite a long time ago, but it's it's moving forward. It's it's like every oh. single man comes across obstacles. Every single woman comes across obstacles, and they they can be either in a fantasy Jungian sense of say slaying the dragon, or they can be literal obstacles that get in the way yep, that yep. then trigger off complexes inside of yourself, which are the real enemies or the real yeah. landscape with which yeah. we should identify mythological characters. So um, I don't I don't know if that, that that's a helpful answer. That's the best I could give. No, mate, it's 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 really helpful, and it's uh, I'm not surprised to hear it. You know, like uh, dealing with it in a very 
uh, emotionally mature way. <laughs> Just being able to realize, well, it's nothing personal. This is something uh, happening in their life and they're mm. now projecting something they really dislike, whether it's about themselves or something they're interested in, you know, onto you. Um, I think uh, it's, it's very true that no one thinks about you c as near as much as you think about you. Mm. And so any second you've spent in a state of anxiety or a, 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 a lower state of um, homeostasis just because someone insulted you is only detriment to you, you know? And um, mm. I think bringing that to the front of mind whenever, you know, there is criticism leveled against you, assuming it's uh, not justified because, you know, it also can be justified, but assuming it's not justified, uh, that's a good way to get over it, you know, but also we're not, we're not evolutionarily, um, developed for this type of criticism, James. I mean, never until the last 40, 50 years, you know, you could be the exact same man you are. You could be, um, ingesting the ideas at the rate you do with, um, great people around you like Stephen Pauline, but 50, 60 years ago, you would have spoken to max a hundred, a thousand people. And therefore your criticism of 1% would have been significantly less, but yeah. now your ideas can potentially reach millions and evolutionarily, we are not prepared. We are not, uh, we, are, we, we haven't evolved to deal with criticism on that scale simply because we haven't evolved to communicate with people on that scale. You know, if 1% of people are malintended and you reach a million people, man, that's a lot of negative feedback coming your way. Um, yeah. I can only imagine how people like Tim Ferriss or Joe Rogan deal with it. I mean, Joe says he doesn't look at his comments, but uh, Tim Ferriss wrote a great um, uh, blog post once about the downsides of fame because he's got an email newsletter that's in the ballpark of 10 million subscribers. Jesus. Yeah, so it's, it's unreal. And say 1% of them? Holy fuck, man. That's 100,000 people who... who un, un, um, who irrationally hate you. And then like a further 1% of that, say a thousand people, they could be homicidal, mate. You know, is yeah. it too much of a stretch to say 0.1% of society is homicidal? I mean, maybe, maybe that's way too much of a stretch to say, but at least psychopathic. I don't know if that's too much. Oh yeah, yeah. There's the, I say more than that would be psychopathic. And imagine uh, that, James, you know? So evolutionarily, we're not, we're not, we're not designed. Oh, well. We're not designed at all, but evolution, we haven't evolved to, um, uh, to deal with criticism on that scale, you know? And I don't know if there's anything worth saying about, but I just wanted to tag. Well, you know, you're, 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 uh, you're absolutely right. If you say somebody, uh, and this often happens with like an overnight sensation or an overnight star, uh, they, if, if they, their growth rapidly exceeds what they are like adapting to, then, um, you know, that can be a serious problem. But you, 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 the human beings are incredibly psychosocially adaptive and adaptable. So, so, you know, take, say, take Tim Ferriss's rise. I'm not overly familiar with it. I know his was kind of like a trickle. Then it was a boom with like the four hour work week, I think from memory, um, that would have been the key moment in which he would have had to adapt to that new level of fame and that new level of, because, you know, um, if we think about the past, we're all descended from King and Queens people who are in charge of countries and they would have had a, you know, to be completely fair, less criticism than say someone like Tim Ferriss would have, mm. you know, which you have a hundred thousand mm. people in the kingdom bashing on the door all at once. It's like, probably not, you, you know, it's in general, some people have had that before. Um, but I think we can, we can take it. And what also helps is the fact that it's virtual as well. It's not seeing individual faces, it's comments, it's words, yeah. and which makes it more easy to sort of cognitively de detach. But what also helps is having, is, is being one grounded in a timeline as much as you can be based on the effort and the work that you put in. So that's the work of the personal myth, but also being in touch with those instincts, which helps alleviate those anxiety states or those depressive states or whatever. It's like, have you got a peer group and people backing you up? Have you got a partner? That kind of stuff. And then you feel stronger. Then you've got like, um, like we call it IPSA, a carder along, alongside you, like Alexander the Great's carder. They're all going through the same thing, all understanding. And it's kind of like, oh, there's like someone who's um, throwing shells or, or, or throwing bombing or whatever from like um, a boat just just outside our aircraft carrier and it's like they can try they could they can try mm. the instincts feel calm it's like threats but fine uh, but I'll, I'll i'll let you know when and if young to live by hits you know one trillion followers <laughs> on instagram or whatever they're, 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 i'll let you know if i go a bit weird then you could remind me of this let, let's bring it a little bit back to gurus and self-help if if we can um i i wrote this down and i wasn't surprised uh to hear your uh position 
on it let's say um you know obviously the 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 way you say it is fresh but the the position nonetheless and and i feel very similarly and and i sort of wrote this um um as an idea of once you realize that the guru is not someone to attach onto but rather extract from um that this could then be the continuation of it right so mm. self-help addresses the needs or of you know being productive optimization efficiency success and so on but one must ask themselves the question as to where these motivations sit on the psychologically healthy humans list of priorities um, because instinctually we are all driven towards individuation whether we consciously realize it or not but therefore with the psychopop and the self-help we might naturally gravitate gravitate towards it um, to both better understand and shortcut as a way of meaning which is to say if you do get involved with Jungian content and the idea of individuation is then brought to the front of mind, you're like, okay, now I'm targeting it more. Whereas before yeah. you're instinctually targeting it, it kind of accelerates the process a bit. Yes. Massa menos. But it's all the, the guru distraction. It's just fishes in the ocean. And this is the, you know, the lovely uh, Musashi way, the warrior metaphor, because as you dive into life through the ocean to the seabed floor, like that's the goal. That's the process of individuation. All the fishes around, all the gurus, all the distractions. Um, that's exactly what they are. You know, they're just uh, stopping you from the actualization. They're they're taking you away from whatever, whatever your instinctual path yes. uh, might be. Um, so yes. you know, in in they, they, you're you're attracted to them for a reason, mm. but they will cluster. Or they they're associated to complexes, and the complexes will cluster around your personal myth through line which is part of your personal myth, it's part of your story. But to get down to who you are at the deepest level behind your persona, we'll say, then uh, who are you? And we were thinking, we were chatting a little bit about this before we started recording. So well, that's, that's, that's a question which uh, the ancient philosophers have asked for a long time and the, the, the stories of mythology ask. It's like, mm -hmm. well, well what, what makes you? We, to answer that question, um, I won't because I can't, mm -hmm. first of all. I'm working on that myself. Mm -hmm. But it's certainly not your complexes. We could definitely all agree on that. Mm -hmm. It's certainly not the stuff that you've picked up and acquired over your life that's going to change and shape your psychosocial mm -hmm. adaptation. It's not you. So the gurus will be distractions, but transference is instructive. That's such a useful thing Steve taught me recently. Transference is instructive. It shouldn't be there for a healthy, adapted person yeah. but we can be like it's here for a reason for example take uh i won't name any names but like so so say there's like uh, if we were going to create our own optimal internet guru to then wheel out like in a marketing sense to then we wheel out into the into the self-improvement sphere what would it be would it be a four young men would it be a, an, an an old woman who who starts talking about the absolute importance of drinking orange squash with bits in it it's like no mm. no that I think is even enough of a grounding to be like, so it's about the person. It's not about what they're saying. Mm -hmm. Some of it's about what they're saying, but ultimately the hook is that particular person. And it's instructive. Whether or not you can reverse engineer why you're attracted to it is the marker of whether or not you will move forward. Otherwise you'll be stuck in an endless cycle. And it's like, why do you feel like you need a dad? Maybe you do, maybe you do. You know, it's like maybe, maybe, maybe you need somebody to come and guide you. But for, for most people, the healthiest thing to do would be to detach. And so instead, instead of going towards a guru to teach them how to behave, it would be to wed their relating function or to move towards wedding their relating function or in Jungian terms, wedding the anima, mm -hmm. which is the journey work of a lifetime. But it's being in sync with that part of you that relates yep. both to yourself and to other people and at all layers of your biology, your psychology and your the, um, the uh, social layer of your life. Yep. So that's far better because that makes you far more adaptable mm -hmm. to fluctuations in your psychosocial environment, in work, in school, in relationships, in whatever. And then things, things change and shift far better than being told, here's the way you should behave. Here's what a man is in a prescriptive top down fashion. Yep. That is very, very important in my opinion. Let's talk about the personal myth guide. Mm. So this is a, um, you know, piece of, you said before, uh, cornerstone, it's like the cornerstone of Jung to live by. Is that what you said off air? Yeah, yeah. yeah. I, I would describe, oh. I have described it as our flagship. Flagship, precisely. Okay, so it's it's this um, flagship book, essentially. But mm -hmm. um, perhaps you want to talk about it a little bit, but 
in the context of gurus, it's interesting to think about, well, why would one want to embark down the journey of understanding their personal myth? You know, because it does inter, um, intersect quite not insidiously at all it, it's quite a natural intersection with the with the guru i mean if you look at the guru the daddy of all gurus jordan peterson has his own self-offering program but nonetheless uh this mm. personal myth guide so what is the personal myth guide james well it's, yeah the that, that guru question's interesting it's why why earlier i think the reframe towards man of personality would be better um, because otherwise there could be a, a conflation between guru and um, receiving any kind of guidance whatsoever. Because then, can you, you know, you, you could call, um, you know, Freud a guru, and it's like probably not, you know, or or Plato a guru. What's that? This kind of really, um, yeah. Um, and and there are lots of these products around on, on 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 the market in terms of the broad category of self development. That's the category, for example, that it's on. I believe on Lulu dot com. The uh, print version is under self improvement. That's that's the, the broadest possible thing. And yeah, there is the the self authoring program. There's been a, there's been an interesting dialectic recently. I wasn't involved, but on the uh, Discord about the self authoring program because it comes to people's minds after the personal myth guide was was released, and a few people reported the same thing. Uh, where, they, where they said they, they all came, they came to this independently. This this is how they've been paying attention to the YouTube channel. One of the questions in the self authoring program is like, ask yourself, what's the person who you want to be? Where do you want to go? What are your dreams? Very inductive, mm. very uh, when you wish upon a star, very Disney, very um, pure and innocent. Mm -hmm. um, it's not a good question, and it's an awful question for oh, yeah. um, self development purposes. In a, especially in a clinical context and even outside of that, because what part of your psyche is answering? It's the same thing, by the way, people can test this if they go take the Myers-Briggs test and depending on their mood, they'll get a different result because a different part of them is answering the test. So it's the same thing. It's what part of you is answering the self-authoring suite. What the personal myth guide contains is an absolute vaccination to that kind of stuff to, to, to seeing whether or not it's you or a complex. Right. So it's the, it's the, um, the apex of Stephen Pauling's clinical work built on the clinical work of Freud, Adler and Jung through their, uh, what, what I've personally described to the students as kind of a syncretic model between all of them, um, all, all, all those different schools, psychosystems analysis. And what, it, what it's doing basically is, is saying that, so there's a teleology built into each individual person. And we know this is the case because, you know, you're formed from two gametes meeting, makes a zygote, so sperm and egg makes a zygote, single cell, and you have a pre-programmed life de lifespan development all the way through until death. Um, at some point, preferably when you're old and it's time for aging and the natural winding down process. And you've got bits and pieces that need to emerge from your genome or broadly your system's biology over your lifespan. So, okay, what happens when something goes wrong? Then you develop what we call, or what Stephen Pauling called an individuation neurosis. It's like, so something has happened, in, usually in terms of your psychosocial adaptation, so that's usually in terms of parental complexes, but not broadly. We shouldn't just approach it like that for psychological hygiene reasons that we call colloquially knocks you off of your personal myth through line. You should have emerged through healthily and everything should have emerged normally, but you've instead you can't hold down a relationship or you have anxiety or you have a waveform of energy that brings you down into what colloquially might be called depression. So distinguish it from actual depression, uh, addiction. You know, all these kind of things, uh, an overwhelming obsession with internet gurus, whatever. There's something that's taking you away with what was meant to be you. And that's what the personal myth guide explains. It's enormous. I believe off the top of my head, it's 458 pages. Precisely. And, yeah. uh, and, yeah. and, and, and only some of it is, is the step-by-step -step personal myth process. And that's, that's mm -hmm. because everything has to be laid out first. Mm -hmm. Everything, especially complexes and the relating function yeah and there's 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 loads more in and around that as well but it's an understanding of the relating function understanding the complex is, is the necessary precursory theory to going in as best as you possibly can if you don't have that theory you could probably do a fairly okay fine grounding job uh -huh. to be like so what's me what's not me can i track my core memories but to understand those is to understand how unconsciously your libido and your attention and your interest and everything else has been guided across your life so that'd be a broad thing is it fair to say as well that it's um, almost a a textbook introduction to depth psychology? Yeah. 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 And I just, I thought it was worthwhile um, bringing up because it is, it's almost the antithesis to the guru worship. It doesn't have to be the antithesis, mm -hmm. but it is an alternative path to the guru worship. Because like we did say earlier, like it is it is um, almost natural on our path that we are going to latch on to several gurus throughout uh, throughout the journey. And perhaps, you know, understanding yourself and answering the big important questions 
by understanding your personal myth is going to um, do a much better job at calling out the BS in the gurus that you see along the way and then attaching onto the really good ideas that you also see uh, in, the, in the gurus along the way. Um, mm. Yes. Yeah. So, so, yeah. so take somebody who, um, pick anyone, so, so anyone listening, pick your favorite guru or any kind of um, case study example. Um, and in a snapshot of a moment, so a snapshot of space time, you're, you're observing the guru, you're learning from, from the guru and your behavior and your libido, your energy, everything is modified by this external imago and the words in which they're speaking with the ego fiction of, cause it is in most cases, um, especially because no one understands the psychodynamic underneath truly in the unconscious, it would have to be an ego fiction to some degree of, um, of what this person is doing for me. So, well, if you put that in a timeline, that's very, very, very different to just sitting there experiencing what this is. And then someone goes, ah, well, um, you, you shouldn't be learning from that guru. You should be learning from that guru. So we'll just take the Peterson, Sam Harris side of stuff. It's like, mm. you should, Sam Harris is right. No, no, Peterson's right. Ah, put them all in a timeline. And you, what you can do, and I've seen people do this. I've done this in um, clinical work. You can just track your father transferences. If we just mm. use clinical words for a second, you can actually track it. It's kind of like, so this is my relationship with daddy, basically. And then this was the, this is the purpose of dad. I understand theoretically what the purpose of dad is. That's in the personal myth guide. This is what I didn't get. And so hang on, wait a minute. As soon as I went off to college or whatever, I noticed an interest in self-improvement. That's so the first one I was away from dad. And my first transference was this person, then this person, then this person, all in a line. And I can track whilst that's going on, my interest or ability to relate to women is going down. Mm -hmm. And my interest in schoolwork is going down. My procrastination is going up. What if you track it like that, like a scientist, like a forensic mind, you can go back and see what the etiology in sort of um, medical language or the original um, originating factor or psychodynamic was that caused this. That then brings consciousness. That's very different to just learning theory to be like, well, this is the purpose of dad, hmm. or this is the purpose of guru. If you have consciousness, consciousness brings with it affect or emotion. That's something you don't get from reading, say, uh, a textbook or watching mm -hmm. a YouTube video mm -hmm. necessarily. You've got to put in the work. It's something Steve said as well. It's like, it's not a quick fix. We're not sending you a, 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 get, ri a get rich quick scheme for the mind. It's, it's, uh, you have oh, to put in the work. The stuff of the snack oil salesman, that's the stuff of the guru. Like, exactly. promise of help. Um, there is nowhere in the, in the personal myth guide where I've said, this is going to help you. <laughs> like it doesn't, it doesn't actually, yeah. because you don't, you don't promise these sort of things. It just says, this is a path, you know, decide yes. to take it or, or don't. Um, if, but if you, you know, put in the work, honestly, genuine and, re and re reflexively, yeah. then it will work. Oh. Uh, unless, unless say there's like severe mental, um, in, in, impairment. Mm -hmm. So for example, it's not going to fix schizophrenia. Yeah, you, right. you know what I mean? <laughs> Uh, it's, it's not going to fix Alzheimer's, but it's going to fix an individuation neurosis. It does. Yeah. And um, hopefully you, if someone is, say, an avid view of, of Jung to live by, um, they would have tracked my changes over time, which I hope I can broadly call development over time. Mm -hmm. Everything, how it shifted and changed. All of that, as I said in my first video I made on the Jung to live by channel, was a result of the personal myth process. Mm. All of it. And the direct membership. With it, Stephen it, is, it is actually quite fascinating. And I'm sure uh most fascinating for you as well but you've you've had this you've had this development take place in public you've had, you know <laughs> and it's all and it's and it's traced over time um which i i can only imagine is like a very uh meta bizarre withdrawn way of looking at something uh you know yeah to, to go back and watch old videos of my like the very early days on youtube mm. which aren't around anymore they're on private on the young to live by channel mm. uh I, I tried to very recently i was like oh my god what well, the weirdest thing as well is my voice is different my voice is now uh, I, was, I was showing someone the, the other day and they said that in the older days including in the, in the um the ion videos or the boyo videos my voice is like it's like i'm speaking from here mm. but now it's like i'm speaking from here my chest it's like I've grounded, I've relaxed. I've, it's like my, my biology has caught up to me being 24 years old. Yeah, and now so, you've yeah, got a it, nice, it is, it healthy is. ginger beard. Oh, yeah, coming through like uh, Luke, Luke, Luke Kelly or my Irish ancestry. Um, you know, uh, James, something interesting you said was uh, tracking, your, tracking your, your projection onto the matter personalities over time. Mm. Was it Dawkins? And then was it Harris? And then was it yep. Peterson? And now who's the next one? I don't know, Joe Rogan or something. Um, there's an interesting point to be made here that our generation and uh, all the generations to come, they're going to have way more exposure to a variety of gurus than even our parents and before certainly had. Because before it might have just been uh, 
the most popular actor of the day or the most popular TV personality of the day or maybe a very popular author of the day, right? And I'm, I'm curious how you think about that. Like, what does the guru pr proliferation say about the culture? The fact that so many more young men and women can now um, latch onto many more gurus than perhaps they, they could have before. Is, is it worth commenting on? Like, is it a natural yes, it phenomenon is. that's not... It is. Okay. I, th I think I think it's actually uh, a really really pertinent point. It's the the proliferation of it. Um, well, it's like what does it result from? Well, ultimately, gurus depend on money, so there has to be a market. It has to be mm -hmm. like if you really just bring it down, sort of like basic business sense. It's like so, uh, why is there a market? So, well, there's a market because well, look at the psychodynamic. People feel like they need to. Well, we say primarily younger men, eighteen to or sixteen, something like that, to thirty-five maybe, um, feel like they need to be led and told what to do and how to live their lives. It's like, well, that's going to be parental. So, mm -hmm. the proliferation and the intensity and everything else is going to be a direct result of a generation of young people who have not received what they needed in an instinctual sense from their parents. So, we, we've spoken a little bit about um, parenting and the next generation before on, mm -hmm. on our chats. Um, the best way to 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 make sure gurus in the sense that they exist right now on the internet go away. And that's a moral choice if anyone wants that or not. But the way to do it would be give your son what he needs. Instinctually, give him what he needs. Because then he doesn't need it from anywhere else. There's no market. But that's a much, uh, it's a very flippant thing to say. Because yeah. how on a, you know, I mean, parenting, I'm not a parent, but it's, uh, it strikes me as a pretty tough job. How do you just provide your son what he needs, your daughter what she needs? reliably uh you know at a sufficient level because i guess there isn't a perfect parent right complexes yeah. are going to develop in your children no matter how good you think you are uh mm. it's a knife's edge either side you're going to de be developing complexes i mean so so speak a little bit more about that then i mean mm -hmm. obviously yeah if you give your children what they need perfectly then they're never going to develop the complexes that allow them that that create the need in them to project onto the guru or the man of personality. Um, yeah. But that's just not the case, you know. So, well, um, well, to, to 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 just to clarify what I said, um, you're absolutely right. There's no such thing as, as a perfect parent, and even say the best intention parents in the world can can produce a child who has some level of maladaptation, mm. um, and it can even be the smallest internal wound um, that can lead to enormous damage in their in their adaptation to the world it just depends on the right external stimulus for it mm. so you're right and it's normal uh, for for say a young man to father transference to some degree mm -hmm. because no one's perfect mm. but what, I'm, what what i'd be referring to and i think the audience would would feel it is when there's a significant guru or gurus over time that significantly impact the way somebody relates to themselves in the outside world where it's like it's clearly not healthy and this person should be moving on with their uh, moving forward with what their genome wants from them. They need to be, if they're a young man, moving forward with a woman, uh, preferably one woman, uh, and uh, climbing up some kind of career ladder, a certain sense of status, and they're moving forward with their own family. Not dicking around, if you'll pardon the pun, with you need to not masturbate for the next three years. Mm. <laughs> you know, that's the type of stuff I'd be referring to. And what I mean is, confirm your son, make him feel like a man, hand on the family torch to say, you are a ex. You know, you, you, I'm, I'm, I'm happy that you are my son as you are mm. as my son. That's what young men need to, need to hear. That's what they're getting by proxy in uh, that kind of proxy confirmation from a lot of the gurus, because yeah, the, the, sure. the baseline assumption unconsciously, which can be raised to consciousness very easily is if you do X, so insert guru teaching here, you are a real man. Mm -hmm. So if mm -hmm. you, if you, if you say to your son or you make your son feel confirmed, he's Im immunized immediately against other men who are looking to oh, confirm yes, themselves so, by confirming yeah. you. That elucidates kind of what I was thinking very well, because mm. it's like, what, what, what is it that um, attaches you? So it's, it's the promise that you are a man because you have now yes. been seen. Yeah, exactly. And, and, yes. and a healthy individual doesn't need confirmation from other people because he's already been confirmed by his own father. Yeah, precisely. Yes. Interesting. You know, there's something here now, it is kind of unrelated, but uh, I really do want to ask you about it because, you know, I'm I'm coming at this from, a, a, as an outsider, you know, I certainly have an interest in the ideas, but I'm not, um, you know, I'm not professionally versed. So it seems to me that a lot of the um, depth psychology, um, biopsycho, biopsychosocial, uh, dynamic framework to sort of view a person 
it's entirely experiential, which is to say um, there are certain, you know, like uh, good and bad practices to say, for instance, raise a child or to um, be a, a responsible man or to, you know, develop your own personal myths, so forth. Something that I find that I have a real, uh, that's really close to my heart is what's the balance between nature versus nurture? Um, because in, in this very rambly way for me to sort of get my point out, but it does seem to me that uh, nurture is given almost 95% uh, weight in, in, in this equation. If you look at it through the biopsychosocial uh, prism, mm. whereas I am, if I look at my own brother, if I look at my, my dad and his brother and it, my, my uh, girlfriend and her brother, the experience, the experiences are so, so similar, yet the outcome couldn't be more different. Mm. And the one ex the, you know, the one through line explanation is, well, perhaps we just have, um, certain nature and it is something which is quite un unquantifiable, but it's, and it's also something that isn't well known, but I'm just curious to see, you know, how you think about that as a, you know, as a depth psychologist and as someone who spends a lot of time thinking about these ideas, um, you know, how do you, how do you think about nature versus nurture? The, well, the best way to frame the question would be, uh, the best way to frame my answer, apologies, would, would be both are important and should be looked at. Most of the time you do look at nurture because nurture is reversible. It's, it's a different question around nature, whether or not that's reversible. Mm. It's like, do you, it's something, you've got a particular gene and it's like, well, in which case you lack the gene to do something else. Now that's not being a biological determinist in any sense, but it's also not being an idiot about it. And being like, well, we do have a biological substrate that is inherited, which does form the substrate from which everything else emerges. Mm -hmm. um, uh, so both both are important. I can't give a percentage on either. But having said that, Stephen Pauline have observed that complexes appear to be or can be inherited biologically mm -hmm. rather than, say, just a familial complex that's passed down psychosocially. You can inherit it biologically. That's an enormous reframe, especially in the field of epigenetics. That's what I've been focusing on a lot recently, to be honest. It's, it's interesting you asked that question. Mm -hmm. I gave a seminar recently to the first cadre of students about uh, genetics and the genomic self mm -hmm. and the potential link between those and dialectical syncretism between uh, the central dogma of molecular biology. Mm -hmm. So that would be um, DNA to RNA to protein. That's uh, Crick's work from the 19... If I, I think central dogma was 61 or 60. Um, and the IPSA model the uh, structure of the psyche complex is the relating function genomic self primarily uh, dna or the genome is going to be the equivalent in a dialectical syncretism sense to uh, the genomic self and it's like okay how do we then map the, the like molecular biology and um, the uh, map of the psyche in the ipsa sense together it's like how, how do we do that well the relating function is very very important the relating function originates from the genome but ultimately, as a complex, it is separate from the genome and it filters the information from the genomic self. It's going it's to needs to operate between uh, protein and DNA in a cell, basically. It's operate between you and your DNA. It's going to operate epigenetically. It's going to operate at the level of gene, um, gene expression. It's like, OK, so uh, can you inherit things epigenetically? Yes. Mm -hmm. So therefore, can you inherit... Um, complexes or the complexes that will influence your relating function epigenetically yes that's we've we've observed how that can happen epigenetically outside of psychology mm -hmm. um in several studies and the, the clinical experience of stephen pauline has backed that up and in terms of molecular biology theory hypothesis and dialectical syncretism what i've just said is a firm solid model for moving forward towards a genetic basis for jungian psychology mm. so the answer is yeah but we don't entirely know so, the, so yeah. but, but and usually though we do focus on, on nurture apologies if that's getting unnecessarily technical no it's good because it's starting to frame a link between biology and personality because mm. na a person's nature if you think about it it is their personality you know and a person's uh, biology is you know what's their you know what's their composition <laughs> you know from mm. hair color to muscle density to whatever but you're suggesting that there is a personality link to the biology which obviously makes yep. sense at a very um intuitive high level but um at the microme you know how does it then go to inform the otherworldly differences between me and my brother who's only a year and a half younger than me you know and we do have night and day personalities 
yet we had exactly the same experience. And I, I can't ask you to comment on the answer to something that you're not familiar with, but nonetheless, um, it is, uh, you know, it just does suggest there is just still so much unknown. Um, well, I, I, I'd go to biology straight away with that. And I'd say, obviously, you've got genetic differences between you, but you've also got epigenetic differences between you. And then, of course, you've then got psychosocial differences between you. And we do not know just off the cuff, um, as like a general rule, what the what the um, the different biological variations between, say, yourself and your brother, how those variations will leave you open to effects from the psychosocial environment changing who you are in relative magnitude. That was a long mm. sentence. Mm. <laughs> uh, it's, it's, it's like, so you could have a very small difference, but the same psychosocial force could then go and fractionate you down like that. Mm. Completely different. Mm. I have observed that before. Yeah. Um, and you're talking about like a one, one interaction at school, yes. you know, and, yes. and that can yes. be the, the trigger. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Um, I actually really do think about it similarly, to be honest. Um, uh, there's so much uh, weight given to the importance of parents and rightly so obviously it's the most important environmental aspect mm -hmm. but god you cannot discount the influence of a friendship group and a school and oh yeah what suburb you live in relative to other people like it's fucking huge the and uh um yeah and and it can be sort of just flippantly discounted because it's like oh but yeah he lives in a great home you know why is he always acting up you know well look at his friends and look at uh, the experiences he might have had as a as a vulnerable 10 11 12 year old incredibly impressionable and just wants friends you know um yep yeah absolutely mm. absolutely um uh, yes and, and so your your story therefore would be different to you your brothers yeah yeah and it's like yeah. you may may have had the same or very but but you know you may have had the same parents but that's not the same thing as parental influence because mm -hmm. depending on your you know, birth order or whatever, your, your parents will act differently between the two of mm -hmm. you. And then there's, there's what you had, it was depending on who the older brother was, they wouldn't have the influence of the younger one until they were older and that yeah. kind of stuff yeah. becomes a whole system. And so there, in many ways, Darwin would be putting two thumbs up at us right now, <laughs> Darwin, because it's like, there's so many ways in which the biology is prone to fractionating down in towards ever increasing levels of adaptability. And that's what the genome wants ultimately yeah. is, um, is that. Yeah, James, we've uh, you know been uh, a little bit around the world, but I I, I think there was a decent uh, at, le at least um, a decent decompression on uh, Google's and uh, Google's <laughs> on the uh, on the guru gurus the matter personality and something we didn't really touch on at all was the internet internetization of Jung. But, um, mm. but nonetheless, I like to I like to close on a on a touch of little poetry here because. Uh, you mentioned before that, you know, uh, life is just one good hero's journey after another. And, you know, whether uh, you fully subscribe to that idea or not, it uh, doesn't make the following passage any less sort of elegant. Um, and Joseph Campbell said, you know, what I think is a good life is one hero journey after another, over and over again. You are called to the realm of adventure. You are called to new horizons. Each time the same problem, do I dare? And then if you do dare, the dangers are there and the help also in the fulfillment or the fiasco. There is always the possibility of a fiasco, but there is also the possibility of bliss. I like it. I like it. I like it. So in your own personal myth, in your own uh, way that you're trying to relate with the world and people around you, don't get sucked into the guru. You know, Jordan Peterson's back. Don't jump back on the Jordan Peterson train straight away. You know, step back a minute, observe, try and learn you know, and try and move on. Yeah, it's, it's, it's such a shame to your own genome, your own ancestral legacy to just hand it over to someone else to control. It's such a shame. And mm. um, whatever, whatever, but you know, that's, it's going to help some people who are reflexive or not necessarily, it's their own personal context. Some people will listen and be like, maybe I should be returned back to myself. Other people don't. And that's okay. It's not a one-on-one -on -one interaction. It's, it's a video on the internet and there's a level of engagement that someone will have with this. Yeah. And, and so it's their own journey and, and I wish them well. Mm -hmm. I wish them well. But I know from, and I can, I can say this defiantly with own personal experience in the limited that I have, it's like the, um, uh, it's, it's so much better to be out of the sphere of following guru after guru after guru pretending that you know who you are. Mm. And it's like, do I know who I am now? And it's like, not to the extent I could, mm. you know, but uh, I do know I'm not them. Mm -hmm. And I do know it's, that's not the path set out for myself. And I hope, and you know, the consciousness helps. It helps. And, um, 
uh, and, and and hopefully the the tracked development quote unquote on the YouTube channel is testament to not only that but um, the hard work Stephen Pauline have put in over the last forty totally. years yeah. plus. So and there's uh, there's no there's no cheap solutions and there's definitely no easy answers. Ultimately, it's going to be your own journey that you're going to have to struggle yes. through. Um, yes. And with that, like James, that. until next time. Take care. Absolute pleasure as always, my friend. See you later, mate.